Hello everybody, welcome to my iBiology presentation. This is part two of a series on multiple sclerosis and remyelination. And part one, the part one presentation is giving, given by Professor Michael Simmons from the Technical University of Munich. I'm Christine Stadelmann from the Institute of Neuropathology in Göttingen, and I'm now in the following presentation going to talk about multiple sclerosis pathology and also of the prospects that we see there for remyelination. MS is a disease that affects approximately 2.5 million people worldwide. It is a disease that not normally starts in young adulthood and that is quite a complex pathogenesis. Nowadays, belief is that there is a genetic predisposition for the disease, but that is accompanied by relevant environmental factors. These factors together lead to an aberrant autodestructive immune response that targets the central nervous system. With regard to the genetic predisposition, we know now that polymorphisms in immune regulatory genes are relevant for the predisposition to get the disease. On the other hand, environmental factors such as EBV, vitamin D, and smoking affect the uh, risk of attracting or contracting the disease. With regard to the disease course, MS is quite special in that it basically changes its face. At the beginning, MS normally presents as a relapsing remitting disease with almost full recovery between the relapses. However, after several years of disease, many patients, around 70%, con convert into a secondary progressive disease phase where disability accumulation basically occurs without superimposed relapses. So basically without, seemingly without, peripheral immune activation. On the contrary, brain volume changes occur basically right from the very start, and there is really a reduction in brain volume, and that decreases and may be a real issue with regard to the de development of the secondary progressive disease phase. What about the pathology of multiple sclerosis? Here, what you see is a fixed brain section with the very prominent periventricular brain lesions that you see here. And these grayish areas are very prominent, very clear. You see them on both sides here, on both hemispheres of the brain. And these represent fully demyelinated multiple sclerosis lesions. Apart from this periventricular area, other predilection sites are the optic nerves, the subpile cortical area that I will come to a bit later, the spinal cord, the brainstem, and also the cerebellum. What are now the key features of MS pathology? On the one hand, clearly the focal demyelinated lesions that I will really discuss in depth in the next minutes, but also diffuse brain pathology seems to be more and more important, especially with increasing disease duration. And this includes meningeal and also parenchymal T-cell infiltration, diffuse microglia activation, neuroaxonal damage and loss, and also then brain atrophy that is probably the sequelae of all those. So in the, this presentation, I will mainly focus on the, on the focal lesion pathology that is observed in MS. This is a typical chronic demyelinated lesion you see the myelin in blue, you see the lesion, the demyelinated lesion in rose. You also see that this lesion is periventricularly localized, so very characteristic for an established MS lesion. You see a very sharp lesion edge. Um, you see basically that the lesion is hypocellular in the lesion center, um, and you don't see a massive accumulation of cells at the lesion edge. So this seemingly is more or less a scar with very, uh, with very little or no ongoing disease activity. Quite different from what I've shown you before is this chronic active or the so-called smoldering lesion. Here, just by almost bare eye, when looking at this slide here, you see that there is an accentuation of cells here at the lesion border around this lesion area here. And you and if you do some immunohistochemistry and look at the slide in more detail, you see that there is an accumulation basically of myelid cells, of macrophages activated microglia. 
And what is also very important, look here at the lesion center. There, practically no microglia activation and also no phagocyte recruitment is found. This microglia activation, phagocyte recruitment, myelin cell activation is very much accompanied by acute axonal damage. And the image that you see here is right from this lesion border, so from this small ring lesion border with apparently some residual demyelinating activity. And what you really look at with this APP immunohistochemistry is disturbance of exonal transport. So you look at accumulated APP here in the exons. And what we know from animal studies and studies in brain trauma, that this APP protein stays there for around three weeks. So basically this means that these exons have been damaged or demyelinated within the last three weeks, or it means that they are persistently functionally impaired. And all this is, of course, very relevant for our understanding of progressive disease. And this is just a schematic illustration of this smoldering lesion activity, basically, that is a hallmark, really, of multiple sclerosis and the most, is the most common lesion type also observed in patients with progressive disease. What about the very early lesion? And one must say that one very rarely has the chance to even see early lesions because a regular, typical MS patient does not undergo brain biopsy, of course. So you really see that only under certain, uh, certain circumstances, especially when the clinical presentation or also the MRI presentation was not um, entirely clear. What you see here is the same staining as before, an LFP pass, histochemistry, again the myelin in blue, again the lesion is rose. You see a hypercellularity there. You see also that the, this hypercellularity is even increased at the lesion edge. And if you do some immunohistochemistry and you look at the macrophages and also the activated microglia, you will again see a clearly accentuated lesion edge here, again speaking for the um, centrifugal lesion um, evolution, basically. But of course, here in this quite early lesion, you see also that the lesion is filled with macrophages in the lesion center. With regard to astrocytes, you may see a beginning astrocyte reaction, reactive astrogliosis, in the lesion itself as well as at the lesion edge. And this is quite important uh, with regard to the animal lesion that I'm going to show you in a minute. With regard to T-cellular infiltration, this may be very scarce in this early lesion uh, that I've just shown you. If you look here, this is CD8 positive cells that we're looking at here. If you would look at the CD3s, you might have about twice the number that I'm showing here. So quite scarce, but getting a bit more with lesion evolution. With regard to our final goal, namely lesion remyelination, of course, the assessment of mature oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocyte precursors, is very relevant in the lesions. And this is, for example, here a staining immunohistochemistry for NOGO A, for mature oligodendrocytes. And as it looks, the mature oligodendrocytes do not seem to be very much impaired. Here, by this lesion formation, you see a bit of a reduction here in the active lesion edge, but not very much so. It even seems that the protein is upregulated in the lesion compared to the periplug white matter. What we very much like to do in our research, but also in routine clinical practice, is really to stage our demyelinating lesions with regard to demyelinating activity, to be able to compare lesions between patients and also lesions between different diseases and to compare basically equal stages of lesion formation. What we use for that purpose is on the one hand the presence of myelin degradation products in macrophages. There we use major and myelin proteins and with the concept that the major myelin proteins need longer to be digested. So if you find still minor myelin proteins such as MOG, C and PMAG in the macrophages, this basically indicates a more recent lesion. What is also, what proves very, very useful is uh, some macrophage activation markers, such as MRP14, that really highlight recently invaded monocytes from the bloodstream. So a very useful marker used for lesion age determination in our setting. 
when do which lesions occur? Or when are they most prominent? And there I think what is very important for you is that on the one hand, the green lesions that are depicted here, these are the actively demyelinating lesions, they occur in monophasic disease, they occur in relapsing remitting disease, they also occur still a bit in the more chronic uh, disease forms, such as uh, secondary progressive and primary progressive MS. But in these later lesion stages, it's really the chronic smoldering, so the chronic active lesions that predominate. Also, of course, the inactive, so-called burned out lesions, and also in part the shadow plaques. And the shadow plaques are here really uh, indicated in rows. So just for comparison, I, my plan here is to also show you a bit, at least, of M NMO lesion pathology, to have a comparison with MS and look at the myelin pathology that may be different in this clinical setting. So these are really spinal cord sections from a neuromyelitis optica patient. And just by looking here at the LFP pass and also at the macrophage immunohistochemistry, you see a huge lesion in the dorsal funiculus and also in the ventral lateral um, spine cord area here. And just from looking at the um, macrophage staining, you might say that from the density that you see that the ventral lateral lesion is much younger, much more recent. Importantly, in 2004, Mendel Lennon has demonstrated that NMO, neuromyelitis optica, is not a spectrum disease of multiple sclerosis or a variant of multiple sclerosis, but really a completely different disease entity. In that she demonstrated that anti equipoint 4 antibodies are really a, a clear ser uh, serum signature of the disease. Neuromyelitis optica is basically a disease characterized by spinal and optic nerve involvement, and of course not all patients with this, these clinical signs and symptoms have anti equipoint 4 antibodies. But those who, ha who have are, anti are designated then anti equipoint 4 autoimmunity, and if you would perform an indirect immunofluorescence assay of these patients, for example, on a red cerebellar section, you would see exactly what I show you here on this slide. That is, you would see a clear and very uh, nice and fine delineation of the peel surface on the one hand and also of the capillaries as seen here on this uh, red brain section, indicating that with the anti equipoint 4 antibodies, you basically label the astrocyte food processes that are abutting the brain capillaries. Now knowing that basically an anti-astrocyte immune response is causative of NMO, and looking at the lesion uh, morphology that you see in the brain, you would probably expect a completely different type of pathology. However, looking at the lesion here on the LFP pass histochemistry, you might really um, get the diagnosis wrong and diagnose an MS lesion if you don't look careful, carefully enough. However, going a bit deeper, looking here at astrocytes, for example, using GFAP immunohistochemistry, you see that astrocytes are largely destroyed in the lesion uh, center towards the lower right and are preserved uh, at the lower, at the upper left uh, border here, where the periplaque white matter is situated. Going then further and really staining for equipoint 4 itself, you see that this immunoreactivity is even further decreased compared to the structural protein GFAP. Again, as an evidence that equipoint 4 antibodies here play a role in the disease. If you then look at oligodendrocytes, so mature and oligodendrocyte progenitor or precursor cells in the lesions using NOGO A and OLIG2 as markers, as we did here, you see that oligodendrocytes are largely absent from these acute lesions, completely destroyed during the early lesion forming process in anti equipoint 4 positive neuromyelitica, uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. Looking then at the myelin, protein pathology a bit more closely, you see that uh, major myelin proteins such as MVP and also PLP are largely preserved in these early lesions, and you would not be easily diagnosing a demyelination here. 
Whereas if you look at MAG or CNP, you find a total decrease or loss of these myelin proteins in the lesions. So very indicative here of different uh, or of distinct pathological demyelinative processes going on. And what one might conclude from that, that there are at least two principal mechanisms of demyelination. On the one hand, a mechanism whereby the oligodendrocyte uh, suffers from a primary damage, from oligodendroglial cell death, and the myelin sheath then degenerates secondarily. And on the other hand, disease settings or pathological circumstances where the primary target of the immune response is the myelin sheath, and either is then uh, removed by the macrophages concomitantly with the oligodendrocyte, or even the oligodendrocytes um, appear preserved to a certain extent. In the next part, I would very much like to come a bit back to what uh, Mika has already discussed, namely disease progression in multiple sclerosis. And certainly this is one of the characteristic features of the disease, and again, as I said already, very special and uh, a so far also unresolved puzzle. And for decades now, neuropathologists have tried to really establish the correlates of progressive disease in their materials. What is very prominent in late-stage MS patients is certainly cortical pathology, and there especially subpile cortical demyelination as delineated here with the arrows. Very characteristic for chronic disease, very widespread in chronic patients, and of course, as you may know, largely undetected by MR imaging, so really escaping our clinical, uh, clinical pathological correlations normally. Um, importantly, however, I think what should be mentioned is that cortical demyelination is not only a feature of late-stage disease, but also occurs early in disease, in disease and may even uh, be present really right at the first disease bout, uh, basically. What may really contribute to the importance um, in chronic disease is, however, that ongoing remyelination that is very efficient in the cortex may decrease with disease duration and thus leave completely demyelinated subpile cortical areas that are, of course, then very easy to visualize as seen here in this um, image. This slide really ser serves two purposes. So the, the right-hand scheme on the one side shows you the, really the discrepancy between white matter demyelination in green, and here mainly periventricularly, as shown here, and cortical demyelination shown in orange here that really outnumbers the volume of white matter demyelination here by far. On the other hand, what is also easily visible on this frontal brain section, and mainly seen on the left-hand scheme here, is the important brain atrophy that is found in quite a proportion of chronic MS patients and that also already starts early in the disease and may be a very first sign even. And there I'm thinking mainly about the MRI data on cortical atrophy as an early sign of, for, of patients that really will convert into secondary progressive disease. What is really the underlying uh, features that contribute to this um, atrophy of the MS brain and also mainly to the cortical atrophy. And there, during the last years, um, really the notion appeared in neuropathology that it's not really that neuropathological, so damage to neurons and axons, is not really only related to focal lesions and does not even correlate well with the focal lesions, but rather is a diffuse phenomenon. And there this work... Um, by Doron Merkler very much contributes, where they show a spine loss in multiple sclerosis cortex independent of focal demyelination. What could now remyelination add to our picture of multiple sclerosis? Remyelination in MS has been discussed for decades, and especially prominent uh, was John Primners in delineating the morphology of uh, remyelination in the MS brain, as shown here in uh, this Annals of Neurology paper where he nicely showed the axons with the uh, thin um, myelin sheaths uh, that indicate remyelination here in this MS plaque. 
to the left hand side, what we really see is a fully remyelinated shadow plaque. And I think this is really where we would, this is really the goal, this is where we would like to go, this is what we would like to achieve for all, all the lesions of all our patients. So have them fully remyelinated after a certain time. Is that a goal that is useful in any way? And Mika has already discussed that, that remyelination very much seems to be the most, or is maybe the most exonoprotective therapy that we may have. Um, however, I think there's some further work has to be done to really dem formally demonstrate that, especially in vivo in the patient. We did a bit of work in that direction and showing here, for example, that the exonal density is higher in remyelinated as compared to demyelinated lesion areas. However, of course, one has to be cautious here. What is the hen and what is the egg? It may also be that remyelination just occurred much more easily in lesion areas that were much less damaged and probably had a higher exonal and probably also higher OPC density here. But still, remyelinated areas in general look much better than demyelinated areas. What about oligodendroglia that we certainly need if we want to induce and stimulate remyelination. Are they, are they there in the chronic lesions? When are they there? When are they lost? Part of these questions are still open, um, and we tried to get closer to some of these aspects in a recent work where we, we looked at uh, oligodendroglial densities in cortical demyelinated lesions, and where we saw that really in the uh, chronic cortical uh, demyelination setting, the uh, no-GoA positive cells as well as the Olig 2 positive cells went very much down. However, in earlier lesions, oligodendroglial densities were much better and even better than normal. So even a stimulation of oligodendroglial densities. Um, however, I think we're still lacking the knowledge about the modes and also the timing of cell death. And probably our therapies should not wait too long, but rather uh, target uh, earlier lesions if possible. A huge step forward uh, with regard our aim of uh, stimulating pro-remyelinative therapies is certainly the detec detection of remyelination and any anyway, myelin in vivo. And there I think in the last years important advances have been made um, with PET imaging. And this is a, a study here by Bruno Stankov that I'm showing here from Paris, who follows up patients and then identifies individual lesions and identifies basically uh, myelin repair, remyelination in these patients. And I think this will be very useful for the future, on the one hand, to establish the neuro and exon protective effect of remyelination, and on the other hand, as an in vivo readout for our remyelinative therapies. So to sum up what I've said, um, MS is pathologically very characteristic, shows a characteristic centrifugal lesion evolution. Um, we still have to identify what really underlies this specific lesion, uh, pattern of lesion formation. In addition, however, we have substantial diffuse and non-focal pathology and also inflammatory and non-inflammatory correlates of progressive disease. And they are not yet fully understood, and we really need to know more about that to fully uh, be able to treat this aspect of disease in our patients. Also, the pathomechanisms of myelin damage and organelloset death are not yet fully understood. And, as Mika also mentioned, remyelination is efficacious in only a small proportion, approximately 20% of patients. So I would clearly identify as research goals to further improve our understanding of MS pathogenesis and lesion evolution, to also formally demonstrate the new protective effect of remyelination, ideally in vivo, using the new imaging technologies, and then also from the cell biological side to identify means to protect and stimulate OPCs in evolving and established MS lesions. With that, of course, I want to thank all the people who contributed this work and you for listening. Thanks a lot.